Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Baker, Senior Community Engagement Manager with Horrid Moto, and joining me today for a conversation on writing is indie author H.D. Hunter. Hey, Kate. Thank you for having me today. I'm so glad you could join me and chat about writing. Um, so why do you write? Yeah, I feel like I could answer this question a thousand different ways, <laughs> depending on the day that it's asked and the mood that I'm in. Um, but to sort of put it plainly, um, so I was reading The Water Dancer, Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, first novel recently, and there's a portion where his narrator says, uh, we must tell our stories and not be ensnared by them. And I think that I could also spend time like unpacking what that means, but um, it gets to the core of using writing as expression, not just for connecting with others, uh, you know, who are in the community with you or even communities beyond you, but also sort of the catharsis of, you know, what it means to be able to tell your story. And, and the way that I'm best able to do that is in a written format. So um, to, to not be ensnared by my own stories and, the, the part of life where that resonates the most is after I've been able to talk to young readers or visit students and, you know, they'll come up to me or they'll hand me uh, a letter later on um, that says something like, hey, I can really relate to something that you've written or I really enjoy meeting you. It's, it's inspired me to write or work on something that I'm doing. Like every time I have one of those moments, I know that all of the hours of work and practice and networking and sometimes rejection, you know, it, it's worth it. You can reach out and, and touch people in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah, I think students lose that sense of like the, the community and the, the connection piece with writing because they always see it, you know, from my 20 years in the classroom, they always see mm -hmm. it as a chore. They see right. it, as, you know, oh, I got to write this paper for class. I have to do assignment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's so important that that we go back to the the storytelling aspect that even if you're writing academically there there should be a story within that that can be sure. research uh, so tell me a little bit about your process you know how did you know publishing your first book uh, a magic door and lost kingdom of peace like did that like once you became published did that change mm -hmm. your writing process <laughs> it only showed me how much I didn't know. Um, <laughs> so like most authors with their first project, I was really eager to get a magic door out. And I had a really strict writing schedule. You know, I wrote every day. Um, I did complete story arcs and character development logs for each. Of, it's a collection of short stories. So I did complete story arcs and character logs for each of my short stories, you know, I timed myself writing per day. I counted my words. I did all of that good stuff. Um, wait, and I put, you, you didn't procrastinate and wait the night <laughs> for the due date? <laughs> I really didn't. Like, I was so gung-ho about it. Like, all right, it's my first book. I'm going to put the pedal to the metal and, and just go for it. And so publishing the book, um, you know, it was a pretty limited distribution. I was doing everything independently. Um, but still a great first experience, a great learning experience to, to really understand, you know, the publishing process end to end. Um, and when I started working on my second book, it was literally the opposite. <laughs> it's like I wrote for eight hours one day, take two weeks off and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, I'm a very organized person, so I had to learn that sometimes you have to let the process come to you and in the times where you're not able to to get words down on your word count there are other productive things that you could do in the meantime that still contribute to the story uh, forms of research forms of immersion in other media that can help inspire you and so having two processes two writing processes that were completely different from my first two projects it opened my mind up to say like okay there's no one way that it's right to do this. And I have to figure out what works for me. But I also, even in knowing what my standard might be, I have to be flexible enough to kind of roll with the punches and accept change as it comes uh, or else, 
you know, I can get caught in a rut with some of these projects. Yeah, that's funny because, you know, so often when I try to talk to students about writing process, <laughs> their process is, well, I'm just going to sit down and get it all done in one <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, so it sounds good in theory. Yeah. yeah, in theory. Like, okay, so it's done. Like, it's on the page. I'm done. But I feel like that's just, you know, the beginning. You know, once your ideas are out on the page, you know, they're out of your head and onto the page, now there's so much more to do with it. Do, so do you do a lot of editing? Like, is it like a cyclical thing or do you write it all and then edit? A hundred percent. I Everywhere that I go and I talk about writing, especially with, with young people and emerging writers, um, I say that writing is revision. Like that, that's the whole thing, you know? Um, I don't think that I can emphasize or underscore enough how much really gets done after you feel like you've finished telling the story. Um, that's, that's really where the magic happens. <laughs> and so I have learned to love uh, editing and revising and I figured out, you know, some different methods that I think help make it more fun for me and more enriching for me because ultimately it does become the better part of uh, anything being released, you know, as quick as you can write it, you're gonna have to really invest some time in, in revising. So I do my own revisions, at least two or three before anybody else ever sees it. Um, I've cultivated a couple of different beta reading groups. And so I have uh, people who are just avid readers, bookstagrammers, uh, educators, um, and who else, other writers. Uh, who will read my works before they come out, give me conceptual feedback, help me understand, you know, how my work is reaching various audiences, try to make sure that those groups are really diverse within themselves and a representative of a lot of different voices and cultures. Um, I have a professional editor. I have two, actually. And so <laughs> you can see as I go on, like, there are definitely round after round after round uh, of editing, but they each, and, and revising, but they each serve their own purpose. And so uh, I think that focusing so heavily on the editing and revising has been what uh, has improved my writing and helped the stuff that I put out, you know, be ready to, to, to impact the world. How do, you, how do you know when you're done? Like, <laughs> it's done. I'm ready here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had to confront this with my second book because... The way that I talk about it now is that um, I knew that the story wasn't done, but it was finished. Uh, and that's sort of the language that I like to use. Uh, sometimes you'll hit a point where, or I'll hit a point where, you know, my mind floods with all of these things that I could do differently with, with the project. And oh, if I just took another three months to change this or that, or if I maneuvered this, or if I wait till this event comes out, then I can, you know, make reference to it in the book. Um, but there's also an internal sense that the story is complete. Uh, even if it's not totally fleshed out in the way that you think is ideal, even if you're still having trouble with some of the concepts, you know, letting go of that idea of perfection. We want to strive for, for what we do to be as best as it can be. But knowing that um, even after things are released, you know, authors have, have little caveats and little things that they know about their work that they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I really wanted to do this differently. So accepting a certain amount of that even before I finish has helped me not to really stress too much about, you know, what gets put out. And I look at my story structure. I make sure that the writing is up to par. Uh, is my narrative solid? Um, does this have the impact that I want it to have? And after that, I kind of have to make peace with it and step away from it even a little bit. Because <laughs> if not, I'm sure most writers you talk to will tell you they'll, they'll edit and revise forever. You know, just keep going. So you mentioned your second book, Torment. Let's go and back to the the beginning now the process like how did mm -hmm. you get inspired to write that book yeah for sure so torment is um a coming of age story for the most part um, and largely about uh, a young man and his family and his sort of quest for identity in true YA coming of age fashion 
um, but through the lens of mental health and how mental health manifests in your community life, your family life, and also your school life. Um, I had a period of really, really tough uh, struggles with mental health prior to writing Torment. Uh, and, you know, I looked in every direction for the support and the help that people told me would help me feel better, right? So uh, I went to therapy for the first time in my life. I tried a bunch of different ways of, of living and being that, you know, I thought could help me feel uh, more confident and just better about the path in life that I was on. And, um, you know, as I started to heal from some of the trauma and jump over some of the challenges that had been kept keeping me stifled, uh, I really, really wanted to, to produce a written work that could do two things. One, that could help me sort of officially close that, that chapter uh, in life and by expressing a, a narrative through, through writing that I think kind of gets to the core of some of the things that I was facing, not all of them, but some of them, um, I thought I could do that. And then secondly, thinking about, you know, not just for my own gratification, but what impact something like that could have on the world and what I used to read as a, as a young adult. And um, I don't remember having very many poignant conversations at, at home, in school or otherwise about, uh, you know, mental health with sort of emotional well-being. So I thought I can do this for me, but I can also produce something that's going to help start conversations in safe spaces, schools and classrooms where, you know, students have the care of uh, a qualified educator, they have the support of their peers that they spend most of their time with, and we can start to tackle some of these like really tough topics that probably don't get enough attention. Um, so I was inspired by events in my own life, but also inspired by the gap in, in conversation about mental health today, knowing that it's on the rise, uh, concerns of mental health are on the rise for you know Generation Z and our young people more so than they were, you know, in my generation and generations past, uh, really leaning into to that conversation and wanting to, to face it full on. Yeah, um, I, I greatly appreciate that, you know, here's a work of art that can open up these conversations because, you know, social emotional learning is a, is a big buzzword mm -hmm. now in education. And, and, I, and I get a little prickly about that because I, I don't think it should be a buzzword. It shouldn't be a special project mm. because really when we look at social emotional learning, it's, it's life For and sure. it's able to function, uh, you know, as an individual, but then also as a member of a group and a member of a greater community, you know, and, and having a healthy community, you know, absolutely mm -hmm. our society and our emotions. So I, I really, you know, I really appreciate that. So I thank you for <laughs> taking the time to, to write about a tough topic and being able to open up and share that as well as, you know, heal your own um, pain that you've had over the years. So would, would you read a section for us from Torment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. A little I have my copy. It's uh, all marked up here. Nice. Oh, I love close. <laughs> Yeah, I got all of my stickers in it and my writings and my highlights. Um, so yes, I tried to pick out a section that I that I, I believe, at least from the feedback that I get, uh, is most people's favorite section, or at least one of them. Um, so this is in a chapter called Scars That Don't Heal. Uh, we essentially have that protagonist that I was talking about, that young man. Um, he's in his family home. He has a sibling that's passed away, and his older sister has come back into town uh, for the memorial service. So they're catching up on life, and he's sort of sharing some of his emotional struggles with her uh, as they wash dishes together, uh, and they have this really tender moment. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. <clears throat> you asked me how I am. How I'm doing. It's kind of like that. A lot of stuff from the past reminds you of how sad it used to be. There really ain't no used to be. 
it's like I still got the scars, but they still hurt too. Keela finished drying the last pot and put a kettle on to make us some tea. The light was dim in the kitchen. Everybody else had gone on to bed. Everything in the house was so old. It had all been the same for as long as I could remember. The cabinets were oak and the countertops gray resin. The kitchen floor was tiled with flowers that didn't look real, but they sure were pretty. One small window above the sink would have let in the sun if it were daytime, but the moon crept through just enough to be remembered. The kettle started squealing and Keela poured us two mugs of lemon tea. I cut my hands around my mug for warmth, letting the steam climb up my nostrils with my face close to the rim. Keela glanced at me in between quiet sips. My turn to talk. You know, we spent all this time looking forward go through tough times and people say it's a process. I'm not sure how much I believe in that anymore though. What if the pain was the process and everything is different now? Maybe things just change that quick and everything is different forever. I spend so much time looking forward, waiting on something better to come and it ain't coming. Maybe it ain't ever coming and I can deal with that. But I don't like playing no fool sitting at the station thinking every howl of the wind is my train. I'd rather just know. I felt the familiar lump in the back of my throat and burning sensation behind my eyes. You've been feeling like this since you moved out on your own or since before? You know, it was a big thing for you to move out. You've, you've accomplished a lot. But that, was spe that was a major step. Aquila was tender. Been feeling like this a long time, Keela. I don't really care too much what I did. It's what I don't think I can do anymore that bothers me. I've been giving it all I got, piecing together a whole bunch of nothings into what I thought was a something. But I stepped back, looked, I mean, really looked. And I just got a pile of nothings and I'm tired. I'm so tired. My voice cracked and tears ran down my cheeks. Keela walked toward me with her arms outstretched and I shuffled backward and turned my body away from her. My sobs grew louder. I tried to stifle them on account of everybody sleeping, but the more I tried to hold them in, the louder they got. Keela cradled my head and neck into her shoulder. She rubbed the back of my head like mama used to do when I was a little boy. I cried even louder. My arms, my arms hung limp at my sides. I was so ashamed. Keela hadn't even been back one night and I had already broken down. I cried because I was sad. Then I got angry because I was crying. Then I cried because I was angry. The more I cried, the uglier it got. Coughs, sobs, stutters. I could feel my whole body shaking as I tried to speak in between sniffles. I'm, I'm broken, Keela. I was made broken. Keela rubbed my head and squeezed me tight with her left arm. Honey, she said, you're a mosaic. I love the tenderness between the characters, the connection, um, the emotion, the release of it. I, I, I told you before I sat down and read Torment all in one sitting. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, do you hear the characters' voices as you're writing them? Like, do they start to take on a specific, like you hear the voice, like as if he's right there and Akilah's right there? <laughs> Yes, they definitely take on a life of their own in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the way that I write now, or one of the ways that I've sort of grown into being most comfortable with writing is a combination between, you know, really outlining and planning my plot and then just kind of letting, letting it rip once I get started. And so um, my characters surprise me sometimes. I, I write things, they do things that I didn't really plan for and expect. <laughs> Um, and I would say the same kind of happens with their voices. Normally around 70 or 80 pages, I'll start to get into a groove where it really feels like the story is writing itself. You know, I just have to be at the helm to make sure that uh, the craft is at a level that it's supposed to be. So uh, especially for a story like Torment where we, the, the setting and the place is pretty prominent and pretty relevant to the lifestyles that the characters are living, um, sort of that small town, Midwestern or Southern feel, 
Um, I definitely had a voice for each character for in my head as I wrote and thinking about not only, you know, the words that they're saying to each other, but how the intonations might sound and, you know, how that might impact what the character says next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the the sister brother relationship in that scene you just read, like it, it's very tangible. You know, you can feel the emotion in that. You know, and and as she embraces him and holds him, just like mm. his mother did. Oh God, it's like, <laughs> I did get all teary eyed. And when you get to the mosaic part, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, we had a a, a a small social media campaign around the, t the maybe the first three or four months that the book was releasing um, called the Criers Club. Oh. And <laughs> people would, <laughs> people would uh, tweet me or text me or shoot me a message on Instagram. And they would send me the page number or the line where they first started crying uh, while reading the book. And so I had like a long thread of just everybody's moments that made them cry. <laughs> Oh, and you think about that type of emotion too, like how we hold that in, but really you need that cathartic release. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a hashtag <laughs> for that criers club or is it just Yes, hashtag criers club. That's it. <laughs> I'll have to go back and uh compare my notes with uh those tweets. Exactly. Uh it, so if Torment were to be made into a movie, we talk about hearing the voices what about the faces like who could you see starring in this representing your different characters yeah i thought about this a lot um i mean it's just fun to think about you know i actually started college as a double major with english you know literature and film so a lot of how i write or how i even approach storytelling has that inherent visual aspect uh, and I'm always thinking about mood and tone and how we convey that, not just in the images in our mind, but, you know, ones that we might actually be able to, to produce. So um, I always thought, you know, that Kamani would need two characters. Uh, and for the younger version of him during all the flashbacks, I would think that Alex Hibbert would be like a great, great uh, young actor to do it. Um, he was in Moonlight. He's been in a couple of other TV series as well. Uh, so Alex Hibbert is my choice for the young Kamani. Uh, Tyler James Williams from the Dear White People movie, as well as Everybody Hates Chris. Um, he's matured into like a really impressive actor now. And I think that sort of how he can embody these brooding demeanors, but also the tenderness and the, the sort of intellectual capacity in some of the characters that he's played more recently uh, would make him like a great adult version Kamani. Tina Lifford uh, from Queen Sugar uh, as Mama. I, I just like the perfect mama. I, I don't think I could, could create anybody better <laughs> if I had those type of powers. Um, and then Tiana Paris uh, from Dear White People, the series, uh, as well as Chirac and uh, a bunch of other things. Her career is really taking off at this point um, as Akila. Like from everything, everything from the range of emotion that she's able to portray successfully as an actress, but also the look, you know, her, her character is like the first time I saw her on the screen, I'm like, that is Akilah, that's her. So yeah, it's fun to play around with this type of stuff. My favorite director of all times, Ava DuVernay. Uh, so I know because I follow her like a puppy around social media um, that she, He's booked through like the next three years to, to, to do any projects. And so it's highly unrealistic that that would ever happen. But if I could make the world how I wanted it to be, those are the actors that I would choose. And I would absolutely, you know, love to have Ava direct anything uh, that I had written. So we need to get you a screenwriter next? Or would you write, <laughs> you write the screenplay version? So I have some practice and some experience on the academic side and a little bit on the freelance side with, with doing things for the screen. But I also am in this phase of my career and life where I really like to play to my competencies. Um, and I really think that the pros is like, that's me, you know, I'm really happy at, about how that part of my career is growing and uh, the growth that I feel in that area. 
I know a ton of other independent at this point. Some of them are moving into traditional creators. Um, some that write for the screen, some that you know work behind the camera. And so like I think the dream would be to to have my work as it stands, to partner with other people who are, you know, just awesome at their craft, uh, and to really be able to bring it to life that way. Mm, maybe we'll start another social media campaign. <laughs> it, the, the power of social media is so impressive. So it, it's like always a good option to think about at the very least. Well, that's how we met. So who knows? It where is. We'll go. It is. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look back on this conversation and go, remember when? Oh, man, that would be amazing. Just like in the archives as a relic. Like this day at this very moment, this yeah. plan was hatched. <laughs> Yeah, it, I, you never know. I'm a big believer in that. Like if you have an idea and, and can figure out, even if you don't know the, all of the steps to make it come to fruition, mm -hmm. you just have like, okay, this is the direction I need to go in. Right. And as you walk that path, okay, you realize you meet people who will help you and will connect you and will inform you. But then also you learn along the way the skills that you might not have had you know, at the beginning of the journey. Absolutely. So I'm, yep. I'm a big believer in, in long-term goals and achievements and making our visions come to life. So let's think about then for our aspiring writers, mm -hmm. you know, to bring that about and to bring your work to life, like what are some common traps for them that you could avoid? <laughs> so the first trap that I noticed most often would be self-doubt. Um, I hear a lot of people who sort of undermine, and I mean, I, I do it sometimes as well, um, who undermine their own writing or their own like status or career as a writer. You know, oh, I don't have anything published, so I'm not a writer or whatever it may be. Uh, and I think that a lot of times, over comparing yourself to what other people are doing or feeling like there's a certain standard of achievement before you can really put your all into your craft or say that you're a part of a writing community or a writing heritage or a writing legacy. Um, it, it stops a lot of people from taking that, those steps, like we talked about, really getting started and um, you know, investing in, in their craft and in their networks and, and all of that stuff. So, Writing is a very emotional process <laughs> and a lot of it is very singular. And then when it's not singular, like when it's time for revision, collaboration, review, it can, it can, it can be, um, it can be tough. <laughs> it can be tough to absorb uh, outside criticism, feedback or information about something that you've spent so long with just you and the project. And, and now it's been exposed to the world and, you know, they're not able to perceive it at that point in time in the way that you intended it to be perceived. So I think understanding like the emotional eco ecosystem of, of bringing something, you know, from a concept to reality is important for young writers that there will be parts of the journey that you're alone. And then there's a good point in that journey to, to come around other people and to kind of like commune, work on things together, get feedback, and that those pieces work in conjunction, you know, so not to let the solitary part get you too down or the community part make you feel too insecure. Uh, if you're writing, then, then you're a writer, you know, and I really try to empower students <laughs> With, with that sort of language and that sort of confidence because everybody starts somewhere. There are people who didn't write uh, professionally in whatever capacity that is until they were much later in life. There are people who start very early. So really owning like your uh, desire, your interest, your skills and your talents and, and just going for it is, is super important. And having people around you who understand the importance of writing to you and will help support you uh, in those moments where you may feel a little bit insecure has been really helpful for me too. Nice. The second thing that I would say in terms of a trap is uh, generally, I would put it as like the business of writing. So in two ways, I think 
The first way would be not understanding the business of writing, <laughs> just the process, if, especially if you don't want, to, I mean, even if you want to self-publish, like what steps are needed to take your idea to reality? Whether you're doing that yourself or whether you're going to seek representation and then try to, you know, have an agent secure, uh, you know, a book deal for you. I think a lot of people stop before they ever get started at how daunting and how long term that that journey sounds like. Uh, well, I mean, even if I wrote this, like, I don't know what I would do with it. I hear that a lot of times. And so, you know. There are so many people who have done this. I, I have uh, a couple of different free blogs uh, on my Medium account about the process of self-publishing my first book. Um, there are endless writers, literary agents, editors, publishers on Twitter who have um, much more content in the same vein, even more specific than I have. And there's just so much opportunity to like to learn. So the fear of you know, what's gonna happen or how do I approach the business of writing um, is a lot less scary when you have the resources to teach you about what you might be, you know, facing. And then the other aspect of the business of writing is like, you know, not, not understanding it is one side, but the other side is kind of shying away from it in, in the belief that it's gonna compromise your art. Mm. Um, and I think that that's a challenge that every creator faces on some level. And there's obviously give and take in the process of, you know, bringing something from just being your project to being a project that everybody can benefit from. <laughs> but I think that um, that's also just a part of life. You know, there are things that you have all for yourself. I have a copy. I have a physical copy of all my first drafts of everything I've written, you know, and like, that's how I'll always remember my work. Um, because at that point in time, it was just me and the project. But for the project to, to really be as impactful as possible, sometimes those outside perspectives and the ways that things have to change, um, you know, those are, those are good things. And so having people not feel like the business of writing automatically means that they're selling out or they're not staying true to their stories, to their communities, to their cultures, it doesn't have to be that way. We all know great literature that has reached us, you know, at whatever point in life that, that we're at um, and really made a difference for us. And guarantee you, none of those is in a first draft state. You know, all of those have <laughs> things that the author wished would have been done differently. But the point is, they were able to do what they needed to do to make sure that it got to your hands and it still had an impact on you. So talking to young writers about that and just kind of like tearing away at some of the the ghoulish specter of the business of writing and what it means to be a writer, uh, because it's really not so daunting when you start to peer into it. Hmm. I, again, like, I, I want to just take some like bites out of all that you're saying and like turn them into posters and like, <laughs> you know, for students to see as they're writing, just be, because mm -hmm. it, again, they're so used to the one and done and then that's it and right. not engaging in that process and not committing to that process. And also um, a lot of times too, like when I've tried to do peer revision or just, you know, kind of community style writing, uh, there is that like self doubt mm. that face like, oh, you know, they're, they're willing to turn in a junkie first draft to me. Like, right. oh, just here, put a grade on it. It's done. <laughs> but when you, as soon as I say to them, like, well, are you ready to publish this work? Then they're like, oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> fix this. Right, and, right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I keep, when I talk to my uh, educator colleagues about this, like the, the language that we use in our classroom spaces, you know, when we talk about writing, it, it can't just be only about the process, you know, oh, mm. characterization, tone, mood, literary devices, but it also right. has to be about, in a way, replicating the publishing experience for students. You know, again, the difference between turn in and publish right. totally creates a different writing experience. Absolutely. Um, I think about that a lot with revision. Um, and 
in the times that I'm able to work directly with students and I can afford to lower the stakes a little bit um, because I'm just a temporary visitor, that is like one of the things that I attack the hardest. I actually don't even give students enough time to finish whatever we work on um, so that they will be more encouraged to go back and revise it. If they started writing on something that they believe in and that they care about, then, you know, you don't have to finish it today, right? So that's one stake removed, but also now you're modeling that process of, you know, I have to go back and work on this later and I, it doesn't have to be done and it doesn't necessarily have to be turned in, but I can really take my time with making it what I want it to be. So you bring up workshops. <laughs> with students and teachers um, mm -hmm. again this whole aspect of community that you know authors as much as we might you know oh it's a published author you're up on a pedestal I can, <laughs> I can talk to you like you're amazing and awesome I'm just a mm -hmm. lowly student I think it's so important having this connection and ability whether it's social media or workshops where authors come in and connect um, you know, so that you can be mentor. So tell us a little bit about those workshops that you run. Yeah, for sure. So it's funny enough that you talk about like the connection and se the, the perceived separation between the classroom and the craft and, you know, writers and students. Um, I've been working as a teaching artist, kind of freelance around the nation for almost the last two years. Um, and I recently was, just starry eyed because I met Renee Watson and she was telling me about how she was a teaching artist in New York schools for like 20 years, you know? So we look at her body of work now and then we think that there's 20 years worth of students from New York who were getting writing instruction, feedback, you know, craft talks, all of that stuff from, from Renee Watson. And like, I can only imagine what that was like and how, how that impacted all of those students' lives. So I don't know that there's like a better match, honestly, than <laughs> authors, students, teachers, that, that triangle. Uh, it's just like, it's wonderful. It's my favorite thing. Um, I, in addition to, to author visits of other kinds, sometimes I will um, go to school systems and do writing workshops. And I would say that they kind of fall into two categories. Um, one would be writing engagement. And this is for when I visit places where students are maybe having some barriers around writing. Um, maybe it's not their core interest. Um, maybe, you know, the teachers have assessed that their writing strength isn't where, you know, they think it could be, right? Having, having a tough time sort of pulling the interest and potential out of students and getting them to, to maybe reframe how they think of writing uh, just so that they can have a more enjoyable experience. And then the other side of the house is like writing craft. So for example, I visited a, a 12th grade creative writing elective uh, section recently. And you know, the talk that I did with those students who are actually already writing things, trying to publish things, uh, was totally different than what like a writing engagement um, workshop would be. You know, just very, very like, detail and then we kind of dive into a lot of those mechanics. So um, yeah, my main philosophy when it comes to writing engagement is like I was talking about earlier, I like to remove the barriers and the stakes from writing. Um, I like to disclaim or preface this by saying I can't do what I do in the classroom without the educators who do what they do there every single day, right? So it's it's like I would be remiss to, to talk about how I come in and orchestrate my workshops without acknowledging that the only reason why removing a barrier from writing is impactful for a student is because there are goals, standards, other things that teachers have to make sure get handled uh, before I get there, right? So. I need teachers to, to do the fabulous jobs that they do every day, to have something to contrast off of so that we can both reach our goals for the students. And so anything that I say about how I might do differently than a teacher does is not to say that the teachers are wrong. <laughs> it's just that they give me the leeway to take a different approach to reach students in a different way. So removing barriers and stakes from writing, um, a, few, a few things. Uh, 
So deadlines and having to turn stuff in, like we talked about. I don't think that I've ever required that a student turn in anything that we did um, for review. A lot of them want to give me their stuff directly <laughs> so that I can read it. But a lot of them also end up excited to give it to their teacher because uh, of another thing, right? The second thing is uh, kind of like student choice. A lot of the time, most of the time, say 90% of the time, I give students the freedom to write about what they want to write about. And that ranges from like genre, topic, form. If we want to get in here and do poetry while I'm here or prose, or you want to write music, you know, I kind of give them the freedom to, to do that. So uh, the choice, the removing the stakes with your timeline, grading comes into that as well, right? Like sometimes teachers will make them extra credit. Sometimes there will be no grade at all, but that takes a lot of pressure off of students too. Um, they can really make it personal. Encouraging collaboration. So you talked about getting students to write in groups or revising groups. Um, I try to figure out some creative ways that they can work together. And, you know, in addition to writing and getting things done, who doesn't like to have fun with their friends, especially in school where you're not supposed to be having fun with your friends, you know? So <laughs> it's like, let's put you all in groups or little pods and just let you be creative, um, you know, for a little bit. If we have the time to spare and I feel like it'll contribute to the, to the quality of the process, then, you know, let's go for that. Um, tangible inspiration. I like to bring things in from the outside world that students may not have experienced yet. So if I've traveled somewhere and I have a knickknack or uh, anything that, you know, your average 13, 14 year old may have not seen, like I like to give that over to them for the duration of the period. Here, hold it, you know, touch it, listen to it. If it's an instrument, shake it around. If it's something with a scent, smell it. Just kind of take yourself out of your school environment you know you're not in your high school or your middle school today you're exactly where this thing came from and you have it it's in your hands and like what did, how does that make the process different for you when instead of writing about ideas we get to write about something that we can can hold and see and feel um so yeah all of that stuff comes together and i'll build these workshops that really i love to have an hour to do them but anytime that i have longer uh you know i can i can build out for that too Recently, I came in for a student workshop uh, with ninth graders, and I had a, a dollar bill from Ghana. I went to Ghana last December, um, and I had you know some paper money from Ghana. I had actually kept it in a container. Um, so in my opinion, it still like kind of smelled like the area where I brought it from. Um, and so that was our physical, like tangible inspiration for the day. Uh, and we did a writing exercise that kind of incorporated all of those elements that I just talked about. Students partnering, uh, the low stakes, um, you know, all of that stuff. And it was pretty wonderful. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest things that I think find, students find helpful <laughs> is, back to my point about not necessarily giving students time to finish things, I also only have them write in super short sprints. So when I first started doing this, there was a little bit of pushback from administrators because they're like, all right, we're bringing you in to, to you know, help students write. And like, they're writing for 12 minutes out of a 60 minute period. <laughs> but um, I think it's worked really well to not overload them with writing in a way that just gets back to the same challenge that we're there trying to, trying to overcome, you know? Uh, I normally don't have students write for more than like four minutes at a time. Um, and for some students, that is like perfect. For some students, it's not enough. For some students, it may be a little much, but it's still a length of time where even if it is a little much, we can talk about, like, all right, well, you wrote for two and a half minutes, right? All you need is a little bit more. It, it's an attainable goal. Um, and so, yes, in terms of writing engagement, all of that in the mix and I, I never do the same thing twice so every workshop that i do is always like a completely new inspiration a completely new take on writing and then we'll pick what elements we're focusing on writing craft is um is is just different it's just like for students who <laughs> love to write uh, i do this for school clubs um those creative writing electives uh, or any other group that's like already interested 
Uh, and so a lot of the things that I talk about here are really craft specific. Uh, my strengths as a writer uh, are kind of like story development. And so I do a piece on deconstructing the traditional story arc. Students will, you know, wonder how they can make their work stand out from, from other work, especially that's uh, similar in genre uh, or topic. And so we kind of just do a big scramble of, all right, so you have your, your story from A to Z that you want to tell. Uh, what if I cancel your whole story and put point Z at point F? Now, like, build out the rest of your art from there, right? So some creative ways of, like, reimagining how stories are told and cornering students into being a little bit more creative with their narrative development. Writing inclusivity in the new age. Um, it's a great time to be writing, especially writing YA, as we have all of these emerging voices and new authors and new cultures that are being represented, especially with um, serious issues that come with different cultures and, and having people who are from those communities and identities be able to write. Um, and so talking about that, but also talking about people who may be writing or desire to write outside their identity and how you can do that like in a respectful manner that preserves the quality of craft and pays respect to the folks who, you know, are in that community that you're representing. Um, so some sensitivity talks around that. I'm also like a big character guy. Like a lot of people are excited when I can come in and do, you know, characters. Everything from naming to development to uh, transforming them over time to writing them across multiple works. Like I really, really get into characters. And so I have a fun time with students on that. Um, and then sometimes just like detangling plot knots, getting into somebody's story that's already written and figuring out how we can make it all make sense uh, with, that, with like doing minimal collateral damage to, <laughs> to the rest of the work that's already done. Uh, so a lot. It's a lot. Uh, but those are kind of the two different sides of the house. And I love to do it. Uh, I've had the privilege to travel literally from, you know, Tampa, Florida to Sacramento, California in the last 18 months and in so many places in between to do this sort of thing. Uh, and it's my favorite part of being a writer, hands down. Nice. Is it, um, do you only do in-person workshops or do you also do uh, digital? So I've done some class visits uh, via video chat and things of that nature. I haven't done any like full workshops in the virtual sense just yet. There's a part of me that I haven't been requested to do any of those. Um, there's a part of me that like really loves the energy of being there in person with students and, you know, taking them through that process while I'm there and they can see me and I can help, uh, you know, directly, like really look at their pages. Um, but the beautiful thing about technology is that we have the capacity to do, you know, a very, very similar version of these workshops with me not being in the same time and places as, as, as students might be. So I'm more than open to it. Uh, I kind of just like, take everything as it comes and try to work it out because it's always an opportunity to, to reach more students. I appreciate your flexibility and your passion uh, and also your approach to writing. Like, you know, the workshop space, it's almost, it was reminding me of like interval training in athletics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so often we're like, go write this paper and you're gonna, you know, a student thinks, oh, I have to write for hours on end when it, it doesn't really need to be that way. Right. Whether you're writing a story or a paper that it, it, those small bursts are much more manageable intervals, like interval training than, you know, mm -hmm. here. Because we would never tell a student to go, go run a marathon. Right. Now, <laughs> right? Like we need to. Right. right. For sure. With writing. We need to mm -hmm. think about training. So anyone's interested in those workshops or just connecting with you, how can they find you, Hugh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways to find me. I am a millennial and of the age where, you know, you can probably reach me better via the internet than of my own like personal devices. <laughs> but I'm most uh, active on Twitter and Instagram. My handle for both is uh, H D underscore T S D. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of pick your poison in terms of which platform you use the most. 
I would say on Instagram, it's, uh, it's definitely more about partnerships with educators, um, partnerships with students, uh, my travels, and some of the stuff that kind of I'm doing in the physical, in the flesh, in the places that I visit. Um, my Twitter is a little bit more of a personality account, um, but for my author persona. So I'm talking a lot more about writing itself, um, the process of writing that I go through, that other people go through, different tips, different news from the literary world, um, and things of that nature. Um, but I'm connected with a, a ton of teachers on both. Uh, and you know, I'm, you can reach me via both and both of those profiles actually have my direct contact information on them. So. Nice. Awesome. We'll be able to find you. So what's next for HD Hunter? <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot is going on. Um, obviously always trying to do more and more workshops, um, visit more places, get in touch with more students. Um, it's been a super busy year, uh, but in a great way. I'm thinking, hoping that I can maybe do one more workshop uh, that I'm in talks to do uh, in my home state of Georgia before the school year is over. So that would be a nice way to, to end the year here at home. Um, but, you know, looking forward to the spring, I already have some stuff scheduled. And so I'll be traveling to Texas and Virginia and some other places to, to engage with students. Um, still working with educators on torment uh, and so talking constantly talking to school librarians uh, ela directors teachers uh, on you know the possibility for it to be integrated into their classroom library or into their curriculum there's actually a teacher right now who um, is interested on in working for uh, a curriculum for the book for the georgia standards which would be like a huge breakthrough um, so that would be really really nice uh, I am writing, as always. <laughs> I have like so many different projects that I'm working on right now. I have two that are priority. Uh, one I can't really talk too much about, but hopefully I can share some news soon. Um, the other is a is a my third book, my first novel, technically, um, and it's YA dystopian, um, super adventury. It's rooted in African-American history and culture, as well as African history and culture. So we have these teen heroes and there's a lot of travel. There's uh, some chase scenes, you know, they have to save the world in, in true white dystopian fashion. And so there's a lot of little steps in between that I think make it a really interesting read. Um, I recently came back from a writer's workshop uh, with a, publish a publisher uh, called Tin House out of Portland, Oregon. Um, and so I was actually able to workshop like the first four chapters of that book um, with Nina LaCour, really like, one of my favorite YA authors, uh, Lillian Rivera, another one of my favorites, and then Morgan Parker, who writes poetry but also has a YA novel out right now. Um, and 17 other brilliant people who are you know, looking to publish their own books soon we spent a weekend in Oregon working on that stuff. I'm currently in the process of trying to uh, secure representation so that I can, you know, try to work on a book deal for that for that third book. Um, and then I guess the last thing that's kind of in the pipeline is connecting with um, people in professional associations. So there are a variety of writing projects, as you know, across the across the nation, um, as well as a bunch of different state versions of you know national council of teachers of english so i'm in talks to to book keynotes at a couple different state conferences um, as well as partnering more closely with some regional writing projects to um, work with teachers i think on some of this stuff that, that more pertains to the workshops and writing instruction and how we how we really deliver that to students uh, so a lot, it's a lot going on, but in the best way possible. And like, I'm just trying to do more and more and more and more and crossing my fingers that, you know, this book will be it. <laughs> uh, I have full confidence that uh, there's going to be great things. Great things are going to come your way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Hugh, so much for taking the time to chat with me today and share your writing process, your art, all of it. Um, I greatly appreciate this connection and the ability to, you know, 
broaden the community of writers that are out there in the world. So thank you. No problem. I'm happy to do it. And I appreciate you. Like I, like I said earlier, the author, teacher, student connection, and then we infuse this element of, of technology into it. You know, it's just like, it's one of the best communities that I've been a part of. And I'm so excited about the opportunity to connect with, with more teachers and students than I currently know. Uh, and to maybe say a few things that you know will help them in their in in their own way. So thank you for allowing me to to talk about this stuff and giving me inroads to to connecting with more people. You are very welcome. This has been a conversation about writing with author H. D. Hunter. I'm your host, Kate Baker, Senior Community Engagement Manager at Edmodo. See you online.